Ja, was passiert hier äh, mit dem Dorf, mit der Kirche, mit dem Friedhof? Es wird alles abgerissen. Äh, die Kirche wird gesprengt, die Dörfer werden geschleift, die Leichen werden ausgebuddelt und umgebettet. Es werden neue Friedhöfe angelegt. Hi, my name is Johan Norberg. I am a writer and an analyst born and raised in Sweden. I encounter great concern about our growing need for energy and its costs, financial and environmental. Many people worry about the continued availability of energy, and most people worry about environmental pollution and global warming. Governments are eager to step in and solve the problem, but their answers have unintended consequences, and they're influenced by lobbyists for special interest groups. It has often stuck us with the wrong solutions, at the cost of alternative solutions that could have worked better. Life in this small German town was good, until a fateful government decision changed things forever. This is the beautiful historic town of Atterwasch. It lies in eastern Germany, close to the border with Poland. It's a small town with some 250 people. Atterwasch is deshalb so schön, weil es hier einen Haufen, weil es hier viel Grün gibt, viele Naturparks, es äh, jede Menge Wälder, Wiesen und Äcker und es ist eigentlich für mich eigentlich die schönste Heimat, die es gibt. Christian Hauschka has lived in Atterwasch since he was seven, when the village was still part of East Germany. Eine Frau und äh, zwei Kinder. Die Kinder sind zwei Jungs, zwei und fünf Jahre alt und sie, sie werden hier in Atterwasch groß und ich möchte, dass sie auch hier alt werden können. Father Matthias Behrendt ist der Pastor at der Lutheran Church, which was originally built in the 1200s. Viele Familien hier äh, können ihren Besitz, ihren Familienbesitz zurückverfolgen über Jahrhunderte, dass also die Eltern und Großeltern und Voreltern schon diesen, äh, auf diesen Höfen gelebt haben. Ich bin hier geboren, ich bin hier aufgewachsen. Ulrich Schulz owns the largest farm in the village. He has almost 500 head of cattle. Wir leben hier und haben ja, seit jeher unseren Lebensunterhalt mit der Landwirtschaft. Atalwasch hat einen sehr engen dörflichen Zusammenhalt. Das heißt, die Nachbarn unterstützen sich gegenseitig, besuchen sich, sind gegenseitig Taufpaten und befreundet. Ein sehr nettes Wohnklima. But to the dismay of the local residents, this town will be torn down. Why? Well, that's a complicated story, and it begins in the capital of Germany, Berlin. The most ambitious transformation of a country's energy sector is taking place right now here in Germany. It is called the Energiewende, the energy transition. After the nuclear disaster in Fukushima, Japan, the German government decided to abolish nuclear power. And it has shut down eight nuclear plants so far. At the same time, the German government wanted to reduce the use of fossil fuels, like coal. So it has been pushing aggressively for renewable sources of power. It has guaranteed the producers of solar and wind power a high fixed price for 20 years. It is a policy that has succeeded in expanding the renewable sector dramatically. This was in order that Germany would create world-leading companies, the Googles and Microsofts of wind farms and solar panels. These would be German jobs, German industry, and because the rest of the world would follow Germany, these would be dominant world companies too. But there has been a detour on the road to the renewable energy transition. The energy vendor in Germany is staggeringly expensive. It's not just expensive. And the price to be paid is mainly by German retail customers, because the Germans essentially exempted much of their industry from the costs of their energy experiment and therefore dumped the costs on the retail side. Since the year 2000, electricity prices in Germany have increased by 80%. Official statistics show that almost 7 million households spend more than 10% of their income on energy. You could say 
This is a cheap price to pay to accelerate innovation in solar. But actually, many German companies slashed the development departments and just produced and installed the same old solar panels to take advantage of the subsidy. Then these companies had trouble competing when the Chinese began producing similar solar panels at a much lower cost. The only way of protecting these European companies was to force protective tariffs on the Chinese. Stifling innovation and punishing the competition are not the only problems. When you start interfering with the market, it causes ripple effects throughout the system. When the wind blows, the cost is zero. When the sun shines, the cost is zero. But when the wind doesn't blow, and when the sun doesn't shine, you need something else on the system. That something else used to be a combination of nuclear and gas. They closed the nuclear, and so the question is, what about the gas? It only runs when the sun isn't shining and when the wind doesn't blow. This wrecks the economics of a gas station. So what do the Germans turn to for backup capacity? Coal. And so the result is that German electricity is now up to 45% generated from coal. It was supposed to be a green energy transition, but to power it takes even more coal than it used to. So the Germans dig more of it up wherever it is. Which brings us back to Atobash. Unfortunately, the town sits on a rich vein of lignite coal. It's some of the dirtiest coal in the world but necessary for Germany's energy transition. So the town's got to go. The whole town. Ja, was passiert hier äh, mit dem Dorf, mit der Kirche, mit dem Friedhof? Es wird alles abgerissen. Äh, die Kirche wird gesprengt, die Dörfer werden geschleift, die Leichen werden ausgebuddelt und umgebettet. Es werden neue Friedhöfe angelegt. This is the brown coal strip mine that will swallow up Atavash and two other neighboring villages. Das war ein ähm, großer Schlag für alle. Mein Vater ist 88 Jahre alt. Äh, wenn ich mit ihm spreche, der dreht sich um bei diesem Thema. Der sagt, ich kann es nicht hören, ich will es nicht hören, ich, ich verarbeite das gar nicht. Macht ja wenig Sinn, dann wieder dann noch mehr Braunkohle zu verbrennen, weil es ist ja keine Energiewende, dann ist es ja nur dann ist es ja die Negierung von der Energiewende. Also für uns völlig unverständlich. Und äh, ja, für mich ist es einfach nur idiotisch. Der, der Umstieg aber in die, in die erneuerbaren Energien hat letztendlich in Deutschland überhaupt nicht funktioniert. To have three objectives of energy policy, security, decarbonisation and competitiveness, and to fail on one is something the politicians should answer for. But to fail on all three, that's a pretty big achievement. But you don't have to go to Germany to see the consequences of government picking winners in the energy game. You can see it right here in the United States. For a while it seemed like bioethanol would replace the expensive gasoline that fuels our cars. Ethanol was this very promising technology which was supposed to cure a lot of our energy problems because it was renewable, it was relatively clean, and the government started subsidizing it in a big way. The US government has subsidized it by more than 20 billion dollars and has required that ethanol be blended into gasoline. But after 2007, when ethanol started to be used more widely, it became hugely controversial. I am 49 years old, it's been 49 years I've been on this farm. <laughs> it is family operation. We got a couple of neighbor boys to help us out, but other than that, it's us. Jeff Kennedy is a dairy farmer in Butler, Pennsylvania. His family has been farming the land for four generations. This land means everything to me. My wife asked me one time if I was going to die in that barn, and I said I probably will. <laughs> this is home. Today we're planting corn, and this is all for our cows to produce milk. Jeff doesn't sell any of his corn for ethanol, but a lot of farmers do. A fifth of American cropland became dedicated to creating fuel, which resulted in much higher grain prices and problems with global food insecurity. A couple years ago, a bushel of corn was $1.50. Last year it was $8.
Farmers in America started producing corn for ethanol purposes rather than other foods for other purposes. I think they've taken too much away from the food industry. Everybody's compromising because of this. If you do an engineering life cycle analysis of the production and the uh, consumption of, of ethanol together, the net effect is negative, that the net energy effect is negative. If ethanol doesn't make sense, why did the government promote it so heavily? It was the result of policymakers guessing that this would be a good way to reduce dependence on imported oil and to lower fossil fuel emissions. So I think in the case of ethanol, the government has picked a technology to win, and that's terrible. That's a nightmare. It's not been good for anyone except the farmers who grow that corn and a couple ethanol companies. When we look at the dead ends that government programs ran into, it's easy to despair. But there is an alternative to politicians deciding top-down which energy source to promote, and that is to rely more on the thousands of scientists, innovators and entrepreneurs who experiment with different solutions every day. And actually, these very same fields have an interesting story to tell about that. Well, you happen to be standing on it right now. It's down there 9,000 feet. It's a shale rock that is in layers, and it contains gas between those layers. Jim Kennedy is Jeff Kennedy's father. Eight years ago, the Kennedys discovered they were sitting on top of the Marcellus Shale. It was an, an eye-opener for all of us. We didn't know it was there, and when we bought this farm, we didn't know it was there. In the 1970s, most people thought that the United States was running out of oil and gas. But one man was convinced that there must be some way to free the reserves that were trapped deep below the ground in shale rock. George Mitchell was the son of a poor immigrant who tended goats in Greece. Mitchell himself worked throughout his university years while he studied geology and petroleum engineering. During the 80s and 90s, he drilled tirelessly into the shale beneath Dallas and Fort Worth, and he injected fluids to release the gas. Many said that he was wasting his time and money. Some called him crazy. But Mitchell persisted and perfected different techniques that he learned from scientists and businesses who were innovating on many other fronts. With a combination of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, drillers can extend the range and the depth at which they can put together these shale gas deposits. And so that means that it's now economical to extract deposits that were, were not economical before the horizontal drilling. You gotta remember now they're going down 9,000 feet. On my land here, they're going out uh, 6,000 more feet laterals on it. Drilling is noisy. Uh, machinery is, is uh, ongoing. Is it disruptive? Yes. It's disruptive for a short period of time compared to the life of the well. The life of these wells are average 25 to 50 years. Whenever you drill gas wells, it has to be transported some way. So consequently, it has to be done with a gas line. It is buried eight foot deep on most places. It's covered back that we can farm over top of it. These guys want to leave that landowner happy when they leave. At least they want to make me happy. What's it like to live with a well once it's there? Like it is right now today, peaceful, quiet. But fracking is controversial. Some chemicals used in the process can be health risks if they're released at the surface. And some people are concerned that if drilling isn't conducted properly, these chemicals or natural gas could be released into the groundwater. They want to be concerned because after these well drillers are gone, we're still here. The residents are still here. We all want clean drinking water. We all need clean drinking water. It's a life resource for all of us. There isn't a day that there isn't DP inspectors here, environmental inspectors here, to make sure everything is handled correctly. This conversation is going on at the local level in a lot of these communities, and I think that's where it should be happening, because it uses local knowledge, and it harnesses the potential for community self-governance to determine what activities are done in their community and how they're done. Because you're not only making decisions for today, you're making decisions that are going to last for years and years and years and down through generations. Long before you were here, about 60 years ago, these antique tractors around me here were run by propane. 
and now they're run by gasoline and diesel fuel. But change is in the air. Something interesting is going on here. You notice how these traditional diesel trucks have tall exhaust pipes to get rid of the dirty fumes. Well, this truck doesn't because it runs on natural gas. This is Saddle Creek Logistics in Lakeland, Florida. They have warehousing and transportation capabilities, in addition to packaging and fulfilling orders for e-commerce. We operate uh, logistics services for customers across the country, from New Jersey to California. Mike Del Bovo is president of Saddle Creek Transportation. Since 2012, Saddle Creek has begun to convert its fleet to CNG, compressed natural gas. We saw that natural gas was going to be a flat line cost of fuel, while diesel, of course, is very volatile. It goes up and down and up and down. It really started out as an opportunity learning about all these new natural gas uh, fields and all the new opportunity to get at a lower cost. And then as we explored it further, we really learned about the sustainable benefits of natural gas as a fuel source versus our diesel engine. So far, they have 200 vehicles that run on CNG. And by 2015, they will have driven about 30 million miles on natural gas. The natural gas under this ground is now replacing dirtier fossil fuels all over the United States. Coal-fired plants are being shut down as we use more gas to generate electricity. And what America has demonstrated is it is perfectly possible to have a big transition from coal to gas and have your energy prices fall, improve your competitiveness and in the process cut your emissions. I don't know what will work out in the end and you don't know. And we have learned that the government certainly doesn't know. But the government can help out by funding basic research to increase our collective knowledge. And it can make sure that we take account of the environmental costs involved in energy production so that we pay for the damage we do and cleaner alternatives get a chance. We can get through this. We may be destructive as a race, but we're also incredibly inventive. If there is anything that we've learned from the fracking revolution, it is that we will be surprised by new technological breakthroughs in the future. Tens of thousands of scientists and entrepreneurs are right now hard at work trying to develop brand new energy sources and perfect amazing technologies because they think they have the key to the future. And at least one of them is probably right. <laughs>